giving. So bless the giver, bless the giving. In Jesus' name, amen. Good morning, church. How you doing today? So, uh, two weeks ago, I preached on powering past problems. Powering past problems. And I wanted to make sure that you didn't receive that title the wrong way. Because I'm pretty sure the last thing we all want is to give power to our past problems. You get what I'm saying? I want you to power past them. Do you guys get it? I don't want you to give power to things that are in the past and already dead. I want you to power past what is currently in your present. You follow that? I want you to power past what is currently in your present. And so we talked about um, James 1, verses 1 through 8 and verse 12. And do you remember James' nickname? Camel Knee James, right? Camel Knee James. Why? He was a man of prayer. He prayed a lot, Right? And so I made the joke that Gina is now Camel Knee Gina, right? Prayed a lot. He was a man of prayer. And if you remember, he introduced himself as the bond servant of Christ, which was very significant because he was Jesus' brother. So he didn't name drop Jesus and say, ooh, look at me, I'm related to Jesus. He said, I'm a bond servant of Christ. Why? We're all bond servants of Christ. There is unity when we all place ourselves on the same level. He did not try and esteem himself above the audience that he was writing to. And then we talked about how he talked about joy in the midst of trial. Joy. Not happiness. Why? Happiness is tied to happenings, right? But in the midst of these trials with joy, there's patience and perseverance that becomes mature, that perfects us, that completes us. In one version, it says it leaves us not lacking anything. In another version, it says lacking nothing. And we talked about how that verse comes from the Department of Redundancy Department, right? Because he says perfect, he says complete, and then he says lacking nothing. Three times to say the same exact thing. Something can't be complete. Perfect, if it's not complete, yet he still chose to say perfect, he still chose to say complete, and then he goes, you know what, just for good measure, in case they have thick skulls, let me say, lacking nothing as well. And then we got to verse 5, how wisdom is the key, right? And we, we talked about the irony that verse 4 ends with, you can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing, and then verse 5, James goes, by the way, if any of you lacks wisdom. <laughs> James making something very, very obvious, but very subtle at the same time. You can be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. By the way, if any of you lacks wisdom, let's talk about that for a minute. So we talked about how wisdom is the key. And that everything in life is meant to mold us more into Christ's image. And verse 12 talked about the reward at the end. Then we also talked about, you guys remember alliteration, right? Proper 
perspective of the promise helps us find proper perspective of our problems, our pain, and our purpose. And so the sentence there was, finding purpose to my pain requires proper perspective of his promise. It's not that I'm safe, it's that I'm saved. And I told you about my encounter with that guy, Josiah, that he believes there's a higher power, but he said he, he couldn't believe that it was the God of the Bible because if the God of the Bible was real, Christians overseas wouldn't be getting killed. He would expect that the God of the Bible would intervene, and that, that's a false assumption. I'm saved. Listen, I'm promised eternity, but I'm not promised tomorrow. And so we talked about how everything that we face on this side of things, at the end of the day, even as terrible as the things are that are happening overseas to our brothers and sisters in the faith, guess what? It's still temporary. It's still a light and momentary affliction that is giving way to a glory that far outweighs them all. Guess what? Those brothers and sisters who may have been slaughtered Right now they're with him. And they're, they're enjoying the glory that Paul talked about. And as horrible as what they went through was, it was still light and momentary. And now they're enjoying the glory that far outweighs them all. And so we're going to have problems. But having joy is not contradictory to the reality of problems. Having joy is having victory even in the midst of difficult circumstances. No matter what we go through, even the worst of persecution, it's all light and momentary. That's going to give way to a glory that far outweighs them all. And then we got to another sentence that I used to sum up what this passage was about. I was pained by my problems until I realized there was purpose to my pain. I was pained by my problems. Come on, who's got problems? Right? Who's got problems? Right. I was pained by my problems until I realized there was purpose to my pain. We serve a God of purpose. Amen? Everything has a purpose. Amen? That was weak. Everything has a purpose. Amen? Yeah. All right. So wisdom is the key that changes our question in the midst of trial from how can I get out of this to what can I get out of this? When you ask what, I, what can I get out of this, even in the midst of problems, that means you're looking at that problem going with God. There's a purpose to my pain. There's a purpose to my problem. And there is something that I can get out of this trial. And so wisdom changes the question from how can I get out of this, which is the most common prayer when trouble hits, to what can I get out of this? Wisdom reminds me that everything in my life has the purpose of molding me into the image of Christ. We've got problems and we've got pain. But guess what? Own it. Own all of it. Own every last problem that you have. Because when we own it, we are giving God the opportunity to work. Listen, God will not work on our problems that we are in denial of. Because that means we have our back to it going, no, I don't got problems, I don't got problems. And God is up there going, boy, you got problems. <laughs> right? <laughs> I'm like, I want to help you with your problems, but until you own the fact that you've got problems, I can't help you. Own your problems. Right? I told you two weeks ago, if you've got a lot of problems, guess what? You've got a lot of room for God to do something in your life. But those people who think that they're perfect and they've got it all together, guess what? The room that they've given God to work is so minimal, and yet they're upset that God's not working. And God's going, if you gave me room, I could work. But until you give me room, I can't work. So if you've got a lot of problems, say amen. Because God's got something for you. But you've got to own those problems. His strength is glorified and magnified in my weakness. 
And so today, we're talking about verses 13 through 17. Actually, let me be honest, we're probably not even getting to 16 and 17 today. (laughs) So, 13 through 15, but we'll still read all five of them just in case I do happen to get there. But as I'm sure you've learned by now, sometimes I don't quite make it to where I think I'm going to make it, right? So, um, (laughs) 13 through 17 is what we'll be reading, and we're talking about owning it today. Own it. You've got issues, you've got weaknesses, you've got struggles, own it. But you know, every once in a while, there is something just too funny that you come across in Facebook land that you just got, you got to use it on a Sunday morning. All right? So with that said, listen, I'm going to put something up. Well, Jen's going to put something up on the screen. If you agree with what's on the screen, I want you to stand in agreement. All right? So Jen, go ahead. Give it to us. Everything happens for a reason. Yeah, come on, people. If you don't stand, I'm going to preach about lying this morning. So (laughs) you better stand. (laughs) Everything happens for a reason. Now, I'm going to put something else on the screen. And if you agree, I want you to stay standing. So, Jen, go ahead and give it to us. Sometimes the reason is you're foolish and make bad. That's right. Whoever was sitting is now standing. That's what I'm talking about. Sometimes the reason is you're foolish and you make bad decisions. Is there an amen in the house this morning? That's right. Thank you. Good job. You can be seated now. (laughs) Own it. You're human. Like I said, for all of you who stayed seated, my next sermon is on deceit and lying and I might use your name. No. Um, <laughs> own it. You're human. You've got issues. And guess what? Sometimes you make really cruddy decisions. I know if I had asked for some people to raise their hand, both hands and both feet would have been up in the air. Yes, I am foolish. And yes, I make bad decisions from time to time. We need to own our weaknesses and our struggles because until we do, God can't bring his strength. So before we dive deeper, I want to I take a look at some his, historical bad decisions. The first one I don't have a slide for, but maybe some of you know about it. Who here remembers Blockbuster? Yeah, Blockbuster, right? Netflix, the CEO of Netflix, early 2000s, goes to the CEO of Blockbuster and he goes, hey, for $50 million, I'll sell you my business. For $50 million, I'll sell you my business. The CEO of Blockbuster, wait, wait, let's, let's go over some numbers. Blockbuster at its peak in 1996 was worth $5 billion. $50 million was 1% of its worth. 1%. Blockbuster rejected the deal because it did not find the Netflix business model appealing or worthwhile. Netflix Netflix is now worth $32 billion. And two years ago, guess what happened to Blockbuster? (laughs) Every last chain shut down. I think that's a bad decision. (laughs) I would hate to be the CEO of Blockbuster and how many times he's replayed that conversation in his head. For $50 million, I could have had Netflix. Bad decision, right? Let's talk about an even worse one. We'll stay in the business world so it doesn't get too personal right off the bat, right? (laughs) Go ahead and put that slide up. Yahoo. In 1998, they refused to buy Google for $1 million. Four years later, Yahoo turns around and says, Google, we'll give you $3 billion. Google goes, no, we want $5 billion. Yahoo said no. (laughs) 
2008, Microsoft comes with $40 billion for Yahoo and says, we'll buy you for $40 billion. And Yahoo says, no thank you. Eight years later, Verizon comes and buys Yahoo for $4.6 billion. Can I just say one thing? I really hope it's not the same CEO from 98 to 2016. <laughs> that's some bad decision making, right? That, that's got to hurt, right? So can we all agree that we make bad decisions from time to time? Come on, who wishes that they could sell something right now for $4.6 billion? <laughs> yeah, $4.6 million, shoot, $4.6 thousand dollars on there, right? <laughs> but here's a guy who was offered $40 billion. And he's like, no, that's not enough. And then eight years later, almost 10%, a little over 10% of what was offered eight years earlier was enough to buy them out. Bad decisions hurt, right? Repeat after me, ouch. <laughs> yeah. That's all you can say about these Blockbuster and Yahoo deals. And so like I said, uh, I talked about business bad decisions because we could get very personal about bad decisions and I just didn't want to get that deep that quick. You know what I mean? Right? We're, we're going to work our way to the deep end this morning. Sometimes I love just doing the cannonball into the deep end and whatever happens, happens. This morning we'll just, we've got our toe in the water, okay? And we're going to wade our way to the deep end. So... With that said, here's the scripture passage. Verses, like I said, we're going to read verses 13 through 17, but I'm pretty sure we're only making it to the end of verse 15. So, with that said, when tempted, no one should say, God is tempting me. For God cannot be tempted by evil, nor does he tempt anyone. But each person is tempted when they are dragged away by their own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin, and sin, when it is full grown, gives birth to death. Don't be deceived, my dear brothers and sisters. Every good and perfect gift is from above, coming down from the Father of the heavenly lights, who does not change like shifting shadows. So, Jen, if we could go back to verse 13. Now, Verse 2 opened up with, Consider it pure joy, my brothers and sisters, whenever you face trials of many kinds. But verse 13, we switch from trials to temptations, which I think we need to be very intentional about understanding that. Why? The theme of today is own it. How many of you have known someone that everything happens to them? You guys know what I'm talking about? Everything happens to them. They are always free of blame. They are never the cause for any of the situations in their life. Everything just happens to them, right? But let's be honest, when it comes to temptations, we've got to own the fact that we're broken. We've got to own the fact that we're weak. In fact, let me say this. If you're perfect, you could honestly leave right now because you don't need today's message, right? I'm talking to broken people this morning. I'm talking to, yeah, I know, some of you are like, he's got a long message today, maybe I should go. No, <laughs> listen, I want you to stay, all right, because it's for you, it's for you, I promise, because it's the word of God. And so, uh, verse 13, the emphasis here is on not falsely accusing God as if he's the one that's appealing to your fleshly evil desires. All power belongs to God, right? I was going to bless you guys with some 1998 black gospel this morning, but I decided not to. I'm just going to, I'm going to read you the lyrics from one of my favorite gospel songs from back then. It says this, Great is our God Almighty, and He is strong at battle. Power belongs to our God. Although a host encamp me, encamp and do surround me, power belongs to our God. I shall not be afraid of the terror by night, nor the arrow by day. I am persuaded, come what may. Trouble behind me. I've got great joy before me. Power belongs to God. Oh, come on now. Power belongs to God. 
Right? That's why Jesus stood in front of his disciples and said, All power in heaven and on earth has been given to me. Jesus has it all. Right? If you look in the Old Testament, before Job's life goes haywire, what happened? The devil had to approach God about Job. Why? God has all power. The devil could not do something to Job until he had to humble himself and go, all right, let me get after your man Job a little bit. And God was like, all right, I trust in his faith. You're not allowed to take his life, but go after him. Why? God has all power. New Testament example. Simon, Simon, indeed, the devil has asked for you. Why? Simon could not be touched by the devil until the devil went to God and said, I want to do some stuff to Simon. <laughs> right? And then Simon's like, what? <laughs> you told the devil what? <laughs> right? <laughs> and Jesus is just like, Simon, listen, I prayed for you. Right? And it's like, no, no, no. No, just say no next time, Jesus. <laughs> just say no. <laughs> right? No works. No means no. <laughs> right? <laughs> But in both the Old Testament and the New Testament, we have a clear picture. The devil cannot do work unless God allows him. Why? All power belongs to God. Plain and simple. I want to give you a Bible verse for free this morning. Are you ready? It's free, so take advantage of it. 30, Psalm 32.10 Many are the woes of the wicked, but the Lord's unfailing love, it surrounds those who trust Him. So guess what? Even when the enemy comes and makes camp around you and has you surrounded and has you thinking you're defeated, Psalm 32.10 says, God's love comes and surrounds you. Guess what? That means He surrounds your troubles. So now there's a warrior of God on the inside and the army of God on the outside and it's the enemy who is surrounded, no longer you who are surrounded. Power belongs to God. But let's look at the reverse of that as well. Come on. The little kid excuse. The devil made me do it. <laughs> right? The devil made me do it. Oh, it's all, it's, all the, it's all the devil's fault. Listen, stop giving the devil power. You have empowered the enemy to a level that he can't even achieve on his own. Right? Like, again, going back to my gospel days, right, there's, there's one track where Fred Hammond is talking about how pastors had to do away with the testimony service because people are getting up and talking about how the devil was with them and the devil made them do No! No, 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 no! Stop giving the devil power. The devil has no power. Guess what? You've got to own that you've got some issues. Oh, that was good, amen. I was expecting crickets. Yeah, you got to own that you've got some issues and some struggles. You've got to own that you've got some problems. Why? When you own it, God can do something about it. But until you own it, you're going to be one of those pointing your fingers outwards. Oh, he made me do it, and she made me do it, and it's not my fault, and it's not my fault, and that will get you nowhere. you got to own it. You know why we give the devil power? Because we're in denial of scripture. And it's easy to point the finger in blame when instead we need to accept the fact, I am broken, I am weak, I do have issues. If we don't own it, we are, I was going to say another word, we are foolishly <laughs> empowering an enemy that in all actuality has no power. I want you to think about that. The devil has no power. And yet, when we live in denial of Scripture, we wrongly empower an enemy that has no power. Who's the fool in that situation? That's what I thought. <laughs> uh, all power belongs to God. Listen, Scripture helps us own the reality because what does it say? Verse 14 each of you is tempted when you are dragged away by 
your own, your own evil desire. You are dragged away by your own evil desire. Just last night, I came across this Twitter battle between a youth pastor and this militant atheist. And the atheist's argument was that all humans are inherently good. He didn't present any evidence about it, but he was, that was his argument. All humans are inherently good, therefore there's no need for a God. Right? And if you guys don't know this, Dan Wynn is our resident apologist expert. Right? Apologetics go to him, right? And so I was remarking with him about what I had seen, and he made the very obvious point. How can an atheist make any comment about what's good? With no standard for good, an atheist can't make a standard about what is inherently good or what is inherently evil. All power belongs to God. We get dragged away by our own evil desire. We were inherently good, right? We were inherently good. God created us, and he said, ooh, this is very good, <laughs> right? <laughs> he didn't just say this is good. He said, ooh, this is very good. And then Eve came. No, I'm kidding, I'm kidding. Um, <laughs> but, you know, <laughs> single guy can say that. Uh, so, <laughs> um, <laughs> so he said, <laughs> this is very good. We were inherently good, but sin, it forever changed that. That which was inherently good was now fallen and corrupt. Sin replaced God as number one in our lives and put us on that throne. And so now our evil desires are to fulfill ourselves. We can all admit that we've got some selfish tendencies deep down inside. Where it is easy on autopilot without even thinking. You're like, oh my goodness, I put myself first without even thinking about it. Why? Sin changed that. Sin took God off the throne and said, you deserve to sit here. You don't. <laughs> Not at all. We were inherently good. We no longer are because sin corrupted that. Now verses 14 and 15. As I said, each one of you is tempted when you are dragged away by your own evil desire and enticed. Then, after desire has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And sin, when it is full grown, it gives birth to death. Now, let me jump back to the last message to bring you back up to this message, okay? We talked about how joy does not equal happiness because happiness is based on happenings. But that's where we as Christians were blessed. Because you see, the greatest happening of all history has already occurred. And that greatest happening of all history, it reverberates throughout time. It is timeless what was done on that day on Calvary 2,000 years ago. Today, I can come to the saving knowledge of Jesus Christ because of what he did 2,000 years ago. Jesus Christ does not have to die today for me to be sin-free today, for me to be clean today. You guys follow that, right? What he did, it was a set point in time, and it reverberates. Christ is the center and the circumference of everything we do as Christians. So Jesus, he suffered the greatest happening in all of history. And guess what? That's a happening that none of us would have been able to handle. If I had to step into where Jesus stepped into, I would have been found greatly unqualified to hang on that cross. I would have suffered death, eternal separation from Christ. Why? I'm no longer inherently good. I am corrupted. We needed the spotless lamb to take our place. The lamb of the world who is now the great shepherd. Amen? He came as a baby, he died on that cross, he rose again, and now he's our great shepherd. We talked about the process, too. It's tough to be patient in the process if you don't trust the process, right? If you, if you can't trust that this process is going anywhere, it's tough to have patience or perseverance in that process. But listen to this. Therefore, since we have such a high priest 
who has ascended into heaven. Jesus, the Son of God. Let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. Listen to this. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Guess what? Jesus has been through the very process that he asks us to go through as Christ's followers. And guess what happened with Jesus? He rose again. He rose again. There is a new life at the end if we persevere and if we're patient. He has been through the process. That's why we can trust the Christian process. There is no other process that has the trustworthy value that Christ does. Why? Christ put himself through the process that he then asks all of us to go through. Listen. Okay, I was Catholic for a few years, so I do not say this disrespectfully or, you know, unsensitively or anything, but I don't need a patron saint of anything to talk to God for me. I don't. I don't need Peter. I don't need Paul. I don't need James. Name all the disciples you want. I don't need any of them. Why? I've got a high priest in Jesus who right now is seated at the right hand of the Father and he's praying for me by name. By name, he's praying for me. Literally, God the Father cannot forget about me because Jesus is going, uh, Dad, what I did, you better remember because what I did covered the cost of everything that he's done that makes him clean and righteous before you. That's why God the Father can't forget anything. But I love that Corey Ten Boom quote that he talks about how God casts our sin into the sea of forgetfulness, but we're so stupid as humans because guess where we go fishing? And it's like, God's like, I, I already forgot about it. Why are you trying to drag it out? It's been forgotten. Go fish somewhere else. <laughs> no fishing allowed. <laughs> Go somewhere else. Poisoned fish, not good for you. Go somewhere else. That's how much Jesus loves us. Not only did he do it, but like I said, he's up there going, God, you better not forget what I did because that covers all of their issues. It covers all of their sin and it's what's going to let them get into heaven to fulfill the ultimate purpose they were created for, which is relationship with the Creator. The day is coming where I'm going to get to have perfect relationship with God Himself. Where time will be nothing. <laughs> but like I told you guys a few weeks ago, I got dibs on David first, right? <laughs> and then I got Peter after that. And then probably Jesus. I know that sounds sacrilegious, but I just need to talk to David and Peter first, right? Uh, <laughs> but man, we're going to get to spend so much like I said, even though time's not going to be a concept in eternity, we're going to be with him in perfect relationship. If we persevere, if we get through it and understand, we have a high priest, we have a Jesus who suffered through all the same temptations we've suffered through. But guess what? He didn't crack and he didn't fail, which means I don't need a saint to go to Jesus for me. I can go to Jesus myself own all of my problems, own all of my issues, and what does it say? Let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. It's a guaranteed result with Jesus. If you persevere with Jesus, your result is guaranteed. You are going to hear... Well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into your reward. It is guaranteed for those who are patient and for those who persevere in Christ Jesus. Forgive me for being a little bit lame, but I'm not going to be a Yahoo who misses out on this blockbuster deal. You get me? You get me? Yeah, thank you, Dan. <laughs> All right? I'm not going to be that guy. I am not going to miss out on this guaranteed deal, which, guess what, is worth far more than $4.6 billion. It's worth more than $5 billion. It's worth more than 
$40 billion. I got a blockbuster deal ahead of me that is guaranteed through Christ Jesus. But now let's be real. Sin has its own process. And the scripture makes clear that our own evil desire, it starts that process. Desire that isn't killed off conceives and gives birth to sin. Right? We're dragged away by our own evil desire. That's the thought that kicks in. But it becomes action when thought meets opportunity. When we don't take care of our weakness and we find an opportunity for our weakness to find life, all of a sudden we're in that position where action determines what we've thought about. I've used this example before, but Ted Bundy, infamous serial killer, rapist, all started with a pornography addiction. That he said it got to the point where everything he was putting into his system, it needed a way out. And the way out was to go do all of the sick, twisted stuff he had been watching. Garbage in, garbage out. Plain and simple. So we're dragged away by our own evil desire. Then after desire is conceived, it gives birth to sin. Listen, when it comes to weakness, when we succumb to weakness, we're weakened in our ability to resist. Have you ever played with like a piece of like metal or something that you just keep bending it back and forth? And then you start to see the crease develop and the discoloration. And you're like, oh, let me keep going, let me keep going. And what happens eventually? It breaks. It's the very same thing with us and sin, right? Like, right, it's uh, in, in helping guys deal with, you know, younger guys deal with some of their issues. One of the things that we talk about is the first look isn't the problem, right? It's the second look, <laughs> right? Like, one of my most embarrassing moments in church. Okay, I'm just going to be very honest. I was like 14 years old. I'm in church one day, and I noticed a woman who had never been at church before. And apparently I was very obvious in how I noticed her because, I know this is somewhat embarrassing, but I'm just being honest. One of my older youth leader type role models, whatever, I didn't realize he was right behind me. And he leans over and he whispers in my ear, try and keep your eyes in your head next time. <laughs> right? <laughs> the first look wasn't the problem. It's when I went back. Do you follow what I'm saying? And so it's the same as with that, that piece of metal that we bend it. And at first it's strong, right? But the more you keep bending it, the weaker that it gets. And eventually it just snaps and gives way. When we succumb, we become weaker in our ability to resist. When we train ourselves to take the path of least resistance, our resolve and strength does not develop. You follow me on that? When we take the path of least resistance, our resolve and strength, it does not develop. Sin, when it is unrestrained, it continues to grow, and inevitably it leads to death. The Jesus process, though it's not safe, it leads to life. But the sin process, it is so easy, but it ends with death each and every time. There is no way that the sin process ever ends in anything even close to resembling life. But with Jesus, the Jesus process, it ends in an eternal reward. But it's not easy. Amen? So now the question is, what are you doing about your weaknesses? Are you aware of them? Are you owning your weaknesses? Because ultimately, this message, it hinders entirely around whether we are owning it. When I preached my message about an opossum, <laughs> I know, it was one of my early ones, but I gave you the example of the rich guy who lived at the top of the mountain. And the road to the top of the mountain had no guardrail. And so he needed to hire a chauffeur, and three guys show up for the test. And the test had one question. How close are you willing to get to the edge? And so the first guy's like, ah, 12, well, a foot. I'll get within a foot of the edge. 
guy takes him to the top. Okay, great. Second driver, how close are you willing to get? The second driver's like, ah, I've been driving 20 years. I can get within six inches, and I'm still good. The rich guy says, okay. Third guy comes. Hey, how close are you willing to get to the edge? And the guy's like, nowhere close to that thing. I will stay as close to the center of the road as possible. And the rich guy goes, higher. Right? Why? Stay away. Don't show off your skills to me. I don't need to risk my riches, the life that I've worked hard for. I'm not going to risk that just so you could show off how good a driver you are. Stay as far away from the danger as possible. One night my family went bowling, right? And my little sister was my shadow until, I don't know, like around 12 or 13 something happened and she was no longer my shadow, right? You guys follow? Yeah. Right? <laughs> all of a sudden, nail polish and all that popped into the picture. Anyways, so she was like my shadow, and we were super, super competitive. Super competitive, okay? The reason she's as great at soccer as she is, I take full credit. I know that's pride, but I'm just saying. I helped her, okay? Um, but me and her were super, super competitive. And so one night, we go bowling as a family, and of course, like, me and Megan, the two youngest, were competing against each other. And after the first couple of rounds, Megan realizes, without bumper rails, she's not getting too many points. You guys get what I'm saying? But I was just like, I could beat her without the rails, right? And so back and forth we went. The first couple of rounds, I jumped out to a big lead because she guttered them, right? Just like each and every time. I'm like, ha ha. You stink, and I'm getting points, and yay, and I'm winning. And then Megan makes the decision, no, you know what, I'm going to go with the bumper rails. Now, if you guys have seen my sister, she's tiny, right? So when she picks up a bowling ball, right, she's <laughs> <laughs> it's like her whole body. Anyways, so Megan decides to go with the bumper rails. And guess what happened at the end of ten rounds of bowling? She beat me so bad. <laughs> oh, man. <laughs> what had happened, though? Pride told me I didn't need the rails to win. Yeah, you guys are getting it. I like that. Pride told me I didn't need the rails to win. But Megan realized without the rails, she wasn't going to get the points necessary for victory. The rails helped keep her on path to get to that reward. You guys know I'm preaching right now, right? Okay, I'm just making sure, right? The rails made sure she got to where she needed to get to to earn the points for victory, but it was my pride that said, I don't need that to get what I need for victory. And let me tell you, at the end of 10 rounds, it was very clear my pride was wrong and Megan's humility had earned her victory. And let me tell you, that wasn't even the worst defeat I ever suffered at Megan's hands. No, the worst one, really, I have no idea how she did it. We went to Costco one day. They had the video game set up. And so we were playing football. That girl whooped me like 73 to 6. I have no idea how she did it because she didn't even know what she was doing. But each and every pass was a touchdown. And I'm standing there going, what is happening right now? I knew my team. I knew their plays. And Megan's just like, ooh, green. Touchdown! <laughs> right? So, like, that's how competitive me and Megan were. But Megan, in this bowling competition, she decided, all right, forget the pride factor. I want to win. And because I want to win, I'm going to put some rails in place to help me get there. Are you using rails or is pride getting in your way? Here's my favorite example of pride in a Christianese sense. How many of you have ever heard, resist the devil and he will flee from you? Is that in scripture? Yes. Yes, it is. But it cracks me up because 97% of the time, all people say is, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Who are you to resist the devil on your own? Like, <laughs> you're powerless. You are powerless against the devil on your own. What does it say before resist the devil? Submit yourself to God. Resist the devil. And then he'll flee from you. 
Guess what? The key is submitting myself to God. When I've submitted myself to God, guess who's standing with me? God himself. That's why the devil then looks at me and goes, oh boy, <laughs> I better run. Why? God is standing there, right? Remember the story I told you about my, my coach, who was the wrestling coach, and that day that I decided to call that kid a moron too many times, and here he came to give me the beating of my life, but guess what? My coach was standing next to me. And even though I was the size of a toothpick, believe it or not, I was, right? I was the size of a toothpick. When he saw the wrestling coach standing next to me, he wasn't coming anywhere near me. God stands with you when you submit yourself to God. That's where resisting the devil comes from, is because you've submitted yourself to God, then you resist the devil, and that's when the devil looks at you and goes, I want no part of that. Why? He knows he's been defeated. He knows that against God, he's got nothing. And so that's why he flees. Not because you resisted the devil, but because you submitted yourself to God. And in submitting yourself to God, that empowers you to resist the devil. The rails help. Are there rails in your life? Are you using bumper rails to help you get to where you need to get to for victory? Proverbs 25, 28 like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Let's review Fruit of the Spirit together. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, faithfulness, self-control. Fruit of the Spirit is self-control. So now listen to the, pro the Jesus process. Without Jesus in our lives, there's no Holy Spirit. And with no Holy Spirit, there can't be any fruit of the Spirit. Which means, back to Proverbs 25, 28, like a city whose walls are broken through is a person who lacks self-control. Without self-control, there's no walls. A city without walls is pointless. But God called up a Nehemiah. Oh, come on, I'm preaching now. God called up a Nehemiah that when that city was laying in ruins, Nehemiah in 52 days was able to rebuild the city's wall in the miraculous timeline why God had called him to rebuild the city walls. There was a vision. There was a desire to bring prestige and honor back to that city. The people of God could have their own city again. And so when we don't have self-control, we are that city with no walls that the enemy can just run in and out of. It is through self-control, a fruit of the Holy Spirit at work in our lives, that we become like a walled city. Without it, there are no walls, there are no rails, and we are in huge, huge trouble. So, you guys, you guys remember that story I told you about how my friend took me to that cow farm? And I quickly realized I was a city slicker, right? So my friend's like a country guy, and he didn't smell anything wrong at the cow farm. Meanwhile, I was gagging and retching as soon as I stepped foot on that cow farm, right? So that quickly showed me my city slicker ways. Now, I'm going to change gears a little bit, but I'm still going to highlight just how much a city slicker I, I was, right? So I've, I've probably been fishing at most five times in my life, at most, okay? And so one day, my mom takes me and my sisters fishing on this pier, and there's all these guys fishing off this pier, and I'm watching them, and they're, they're casting out, and their casts are like, you know, six miles long, right? Like, that thing just soars, right? And so here I am with my little, like, tiny pole, and I cast, and it, like, goes nowhere, right? Like, gets in, like, Megan's hair or something, right? And it's just like, I'm doing terrible with it, right? But then, again, I, I, I'm still small at this point. I, I figured out this trick, right? There were, there were rails on the pier. I figured out this trick that if I threw my body weight into the rail, the rail kept me up, but I had strength to cast out further. And so that's what I wanted. I wanted to look like I was, you know, one of these fisherman pro dudes on the pier, right? And so I kept leaning into that railing, and it helped me cast out into deeper waters. And then I finally had figured it out. Finally realize, okay, this is where I got to release. 
Like, I'm going to get the best cast of my life. So I wound up like I was like a Hall of Fame pitcher or something. I mean, I, I rocked it back. And I just, <laughs> stupid me. I closed my eyes. <laughs> closed my eyes. And I cast. And I throw all of my weight into the railing where there happens to be a gap. I go head first into the ocean off of this, <laughs> off, off, off of this pier because I put everything in there. I probably looked like an Olympic diver, okay? Like I just, <laughs> and there was a gap in the railing, and I go soaring through this gap. But the best part is it's so unexpected. I am screaming like a girl. Just at the top of my lungs, convinced I'm about to die. I'm just screaming, and then all of a sudden, I hear my mom go, Shut up! Stand up! <laughs> so the hysteria calms down, and when I stand up, the water's up to my knees. And I get back on the railing, and I could not look anyone in the eye. Like, that was it. Fishing trip over. Like, we were not staying there. My pride had been severely compromised in that moment. What happened? I had gotten used to throwing my weight into the railing, but I didn't stop to make sure the railing was secure. I didn't stop to make sure that the railing covered the entire length of the pier. There was a gap in the railing, and a moment of strength became a massive, massive moment of weakness. I know. You <laughs> I'm asking God for the DVR of that one. I really am, because it's so great. But <laughs> there was a gap in the rail. There was a gap in the rail, and I fell into where I was trying to fish. Now, I know that in this passage, there's nothing about evangelism or reaching out to those who are lost, but I'm going to preach from the illustration for a minute. The resistance of the rail in my life is what gave me the strength to cast out into deeper water. Do you hear what I'm saying? Because I was not in the same body of water as those fish. I was using that railing as a source of strength to be able to cast out into deeper water to go fishing. And I want you to know it's the same with our weaknesses and our struggles, that when those who are lost see, because you see, here, here's, here's a problem that we have. We view a railing as a limitation, when in reality, the railing is just outlining where the freedom exists. And that's a beautiful picture. That's a beautiful picture. Hey, anywhere within this railing, grace abounds for you. But man, be like David and take that one step outside and watch what happens. Right? David, in a moment of weakness a moment of pride, a moment of lust, he succumbs, and that weakness causes a whole mess. Make sure those rails are intact. Make sure that you've got railings in place to help you get to where you need to get because we are human, and if we don't put railings in place, you're going to look like me on that pier, being all cocky, thinking I was about to have the best cast of my life. And there I go, <laughs> head first into the ocean. But the beautiful thing about Jesus, unlike my mother, <laughs> I love my mom, just for the record, <laughs> but unlike my mother, he does not say, shut up. <laughs> he helps me out of there. And then he helps me realize where the gap in the rail was. And guess what? With him, I can patch that rail up. So that now I can have the confidence that even sometimes when I throw my weight into that railing, I can trust that that railing is going to keep me from falling into that thing that's going to eat me alive. 
Because James says it clearly. It's going to lead to death, plain and simply. I thought I was going to drown that day. I was sure of it. That's why I was screaming so loud. <laughs> Fortunately, it wasn't the death of me, and I can tell you this hilarious story now. But I want you to know, we have a God. If you're finding yourself in that ocean right now, where you know you kept succumbing to the same weakness over and over and you feel like you can't get out, I want you to know there's a God on your side. First of all, he walks on water, right? So he can come meet you no matter how deep the water is. And he does it all calm, cool, and collected. And maybe you'll have your disciple moment where you think it's a ghost, but it's Jesus, and he's coming to you, and he can pull you up out of that that even though it might be overwhelming, I want you to know with God on your side, you can see that the weaknesses in your life, it's really just knee deep. That wave that you thought was monstrous, with God on your side, he picks you up and you realize all of a sudden, man, with God on my side, I got this. I can trust the railing. I'm going to go back and appreciate the railing. The resistance of the railing is what gave me strength when it came to fishing that day. And I want you to know, God, he can rescue you from any and every situation. But here's where we start to put the weaknesses in our lives to death. We need to realize one thing. This world has nothing for me. It's got nothing for me. In the eternal scope of things, this world has got absolutely nothing. Nothing for me. But God, he can rescue you. God, he can help you rebuild the walls like Nehemiah rebuilt the walls of Jerusalem. He can help you patch that railing up so that you can make it down the lane to knock down all the pins and get all the points you need for victory. With God, all of that is possible. But guess what? You gotta own it. You gotta own it, plain and simply. So I'm a little bit over time, so I can't stay here and pray with you. But here's what I want to do. We're going to play this song. It's got the, the lyrics will be up on the screen. But I just want you to have a time of meditation as this song plays. And then at the end of the song, you can be free to go. So I'm just going to pray a prayer of dismissal now. But just right now where you are, I want you to think about the railings in your life. Which ones need to be founded a little bit better? Which ones have a lot of gaps that you might be able to fall through and know that with Jesus on your side, he can rebuild the walls, he can patch all the gaps in the rail, and you can be assured that he's going to help you stay on the straight and narrow to be able to hear that voice at the, end of the, at the end of the race, at the end of the journey. Well done, good and faithful servant. Now enter into your reward. Jesus, I thank you for your word. Lord, I pray for all of us right now, Lord, that you would help us to own our weaknesses and our struggles and know you can rescue us from them, but that we must submit ourselves to you first. And in submitting ourselves to you, we find the strength to resist the devil who then has to flee. So God, strengthen me today. Encourage me today, Lord. And Lord, through your Holy Spirit, give me the wisdom to see where the railing is out so that I can fix it and know that I'm, I'm doing everything I can to stay away from that which will overwhelm me and that which will lead to death. And I'm staying on the path that ends with eternal life. In Jesus' name, amen. So the song will play, and at the end of the song...